Okay, this will be a video on the intermediate value theorem. And this is actually a pretty easy theorem to use. Um, what we'll do is, first of all, just draw a picture of it over here to show you what the thing actually looks like if you do it looked at it in graphical form. Then we'll work through three examples and show you how to use it. Now, it really starts out by saying this, that if you have a continuous function f of x, and the important thing is that it has to be continuous on a closed interval from a to b, and we'll sort of draw a picture of this as we go through. So let's suppose, just to pick a number, suppose that the, it went from a, and we'll let a be 1, and let's suppose that b is 5. So you've got a closed interval from a to b. And it says, now if we've got a, and just again, to pick some specific points, let's suppose that when... Uh, x is equal to 1, that this is a, this point then would be f at a. So there's the point a and f of it. <clears throat> there's the left end point of the interval. Then the right end point of the interval, suppose when b is equal to 5, and let's just to kind of pick a number, let's suppose we pick 6 up here. This would be f at b. And what you're saying is that uh, if the function is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, that you've got an f of a, you've got an f at b. And if it is continuous, then somewhere in this range between f of a and f of b, there exists a number k. And we'll just put k in and suppose that k is right here. So let's suppose that's k. And I'll go across and put a dotted line that runs across like this. Now, if the function's continuous, <clears throat> let's just draw it in here. I'll just put a function, suppose the function looks something like this right here. So there's a continuous function between a and b. And if it's continuous, there exists a number k. Uh, um, number k between a and b. So k is somewhere between here and here. Then there exists at least one number c in the interval such that f at c is equal to k. So what that means, if you go from here and come down to here, that somewhere there's a value of x that guarantees that the function will be equal to this number k. Now all it really says is this, is that if the function is continuous and it runs from 2 to 6, the intermediate value theorem guarantees that the function has to take on every point in the interval between there. So it has to take on every intermediate value as it goes from here to here. Now, it also, it could do this. It could take them more than once. In other words, it's possible the function might do something like this. Maybe it comes from here, and it goes up and down and up again. In that case, you would have, you can kind of think of it as a C1, um, a C2, and perhaps uh, if we came down to here, a C3. So it might, there might be more than uh, one point where uh, the function takes on the value of k. But you're guaranteed that there is at least one if it's continuous. Now, in this form, it's not particularly handy. In most cases, in the first calculus course, what you'll use this thing for is to show uh, that if you have a continuous function and a closed interval, you can use the intermediate value theorem to guarantee the existence of a zero in that interval. So let's take a look and see what that looks like. Now, it'll actually kind of follow this form. So we'll go down to here and change it just a little bit. Now, in this case, let's suppose that we're looking at the interval from, uh, again, from 1 to 5. So in this case, if you evaluate uh, the function at the left end point of the interval, so this would be a right here at the left end point of the interval, and let's just suppose that it turned out to be uh, right here. You wind up with a point, um, so f at 1 turned out to be negative. It's below the x-axis. Actually, it's a negative 4, but anyway, it's a negative right here. Then you evaluate f at um, 5. So you evaluate it at the right end point, and suppose it turned out to be positive. So in this case, let's just give it a number. Suppose it was a positive 4. So this one turned out to be positive. So again, this one, the left end point was negative. The right end point is positive. If the function is continuous, and this should make seem reasonable to you from a common sense point of view, if it's continuous, that means that somewhere in there, it has to cross the x-axis at least once. So if it's a continuous function. So in this case, this would have a zero, and you're not quite sure where that zero is necessarily, but you're guaranteed there's at least one zero in there. Now again, there might be more. It's possible it could do something like this. Maybe the function will go up and go down, up, down, up, and maybe it looks something like that. 
uh, there could be uh, several zeros in there, but you're guaranteed that there's at least one zero. Again, this thing only works if the function is continuous. If it's not continuous, then you can't use the intermediate value theorem. So let's use, uh, let's look at a couple of examples now. We'll actually look at three examples. In the first example, it will work just fine and you'll guarantee uh, the existence of a zero. In the second example, um, we'll look at a case where it's inconclusive. And in the third example, we'll look at you got a case where you misapply it. So let's take a look at these three examples. Okay, first example looks like this. And we'll do the following. We've got a function. Uh, we have an interval from 2 to 4. And your job is to show that uh, use the intermediate value theorem to guarantee the existence of at least one zero on this interval. So again, let's kind of draw picture of it and we'll sort of run through this thing. Now the idea is it's going to go from 2, so uh, this is uh, the left end point of the interval, it, and we've got 4, this is the right end point of the interval. Now what you'd like to do is evaluate the function at the left end point and see if the function is positive or negative. Then evaluate it at the right end point, again see if it's positive or negative. Now if they turn out to be opposite signs, if one of them is negative and one of them is positive, then you're guaranteed that somewhere in there the function had to cross the x-axis. So let's try and see what that looks like. So again, first of all, we'll evaluate it at the left end point. So I've got f at 2, and just everywhere you've got an x plug in a 2, so 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 2. Okay, that's going to give me 4 minus 8 plus 2, which would be a negative 2. So I've got that f at the left end point, it's a negative. Now the important thing here is just that it's negative. You don't really care if it's what, what that number is. We'll go ahead and put it on the graph here. I've got a negative 2, which puts me right here. But the important thing, again, is that it is negative. Now we'll evaluate it at the right end point. So f at 4, and you're just curious if it's positive or negative. So this is going to be 4 squared minus 4 times 4 plus 2, which would be equal to 16 minus 16 plus 2. So at the right end point, f at 4 is going to be equal to 2. Again, the important thing here is that it is positive. These two are of opposite signs. So um, when x is equal to 4, the function is equal to 2, and you'd have a point right here. Now, <clears throat> all polynomials are continuous, so this is a continuous function, so it satisfies the requirements for the intermediate value theorem. And you evaluated the left end point was negative, the right end point was positive, they're opposite signs, so you can conclude uh, there um, is, and it's important to put at least one. There may be more than one, but there is at least one, and I think I'll underline the at least one, zero in the interval. In the interval. So there's got to be at least one zero in the interval. Now, if you were to actually graph this, what the graph of this thing would look like, it actually goes something like this and comes up and looks something like that. So sure enough, there is a zero right here. So in this example, um, you had a continuous function. You evaluated at the left end point, the right end point. The two gave you opposite signs. One of them was negative, one of them was positive. So you can conclude that there is at least one zero in the interval. So this is a case where the intermediate value theorem worked just fine. Now again, there might be more than one, but there's at least one interval in there, or one zero in there. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, another example. Now in this example, it'll be inconclusive. Okay, um, now in this example, we'll do the same thing. Again, we've got a polynomial, it's continuous, and we've got an interval from 1 to 6. So first of all, the interval is going to go from, uh, let's put it over here, it's going to go from 1 over to 6. And again, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, evaluate it at the left end point and figure out if it's positive or negative. Evaluate it at the right end point, figure out if it's positive or negative, and then that will tell you what you've got. 
So first of all, let's try the left endpoint. So I go f at 1, which gives me the negative of 1 squared plus 6 times 1 minus 7. So that's going to give me a negative 1 plus 6 minus 7, which is going to give me a negative 2. So at the left endpoint, um, it is negative. Again, if we put the plot on the graph here, it would actually wind up at 1. I got a negative 2 right here. But the point is that it is negative. Now, if I evaluate the right endpoint and it turns out to be positive, then I can guarantee that there's at least one zero in there. And so let's try that. So this time, I'll evaluate it at the right endpoint. So that gives me negative, and I've got a 6 squared plus 6 times 6 minus 7. So that gives me a negative 36 plus 36 minus 7. So that's going to be a negative 7. So at the right end point, f at 6 is equal to a negative 7, which is also negative. So I got a negative at the left end point. I got a negative at the right end point. And in this case, it actually turned out to be a negative 7. If we have actually plotted it, it would be down about right here. But the thing is, it turned out to be negative. Now, in this case, um, all this tells you is that if you had found, if one of them had been negative and one of them has been positive, you would be guaranteed there would be a zero in there somewhere. But in this case, one of them is negative and the other one is negative. They have the same sign. So what this tells you, in this case, you'd have to do this. Both of them have the same sign. And all this means is that the test is inconclusive. So the test is inconclusive, and you can't conclude anything. Maybe there's a zero in there, and maybe there's not. So it's possible, here, here's some, let's just draw some possibilities. It's possible that maybe it uh, does something like this. It might go up like this and go down like this, and there wouldn't be any zeros in there. It's also possible that it might do this, and there could be maybe a couple of zeros in there. And in that case, and actually if you were to graph this thing, that's pretty much what it looks like. It's going to have a couple of zeros in there. So in this case, uh, because the left end point and the right end point turned out to be the same sign, the test is inconclusive, and you can't draw any conclusions. Maybe there's a zero in there, and maybe there's not. So sometimes the test uh, will not give you a conclusive answer. Now there's one other possibility, and that is <coughs> uh, a misapplication of the test. So let's take a look at that. Okay, now in this case, uh, let's go ahead and run through this. Now again, what the intermediate value theorem requires is, I think we'll go back to the beginning on this one. Let's go to here. It says this, that it must be continuous. The function has to be continuous for the intermediate value theorem to work. So let's go back to our example here and see what we've got. So again, we want to go from 1 to 4. And we'll do the same move down to 4. We'll evaluate at the left end point. So f at 1 would be equal to 1 divided by 1 minus 3. So that's going to give you 1 divided by negative 2, or a negative 1 half, which is negative. So here you got a negative 1 half. It's negative. This one is negative. So now we'll evaluate it at the right end point and see if it's positive. So if I go f at 4, would be 4 minus 3, which is 1 divided by 1, which is 1, which indeed is positive. So at 4, I've got a 1, which is right here. Here. And actually, this one half should have been a little bit more about right there. So it's tempting to do this. It's tempting to say, well, this one turned out to be positive. So it's tempting to say, well, the left end point was negative and the right end point is positive. Therefore, you guaranteed the existence of a zero in there. But if you think about it, that's actually not true. And the problem is, again, going back to the definition, is that the original function is not continuous in that interval. 
So if you if x is equal to 3, then you'd have 3 minus 3, you'd have an asymptote in here. So if you actually drew a picture of this thing, here's what it would look like. You're going to have a vertical asymptote right here that goes right through 3. And if you were to actually draw the graph, what the graph would look like, it goes, here's one half right here. It comes in something like this and goes down like that. And on this side, it will come like this and go up like that. And the graph itself is going to look like that. So it never does have a zero in this interval. So again, uh, uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot use the intermediate value theorem here because it is not, the original function is not continuous. So just be careful when you try to use it. It's if, uh, as long as the original function is continuous and you get uh, the left endpoint has one sign, the right endpoint has another sign, you're guaranteed that there's a zero. But if the original function is not continuous in the interval that you're interested in, then you cannot use the intermediate value theorem uh, because it doesn't satisfy the conditions. Uh, so anyway, there's three examples. One of them, it worked fine. Uh, the second one, the test was inconclusive. And the third one uh, was a case where really you should have never even tried to use the intermediate value theorem to start with because it wasn't continuous. So let's go back and take one last quick look at it. And again, as long as it's con continuous, and I think I'll actually um, highlight this right in here, is that the function must be continuous. That may be the most important part of the thing. And then the intermediate value theorem guarantees, and I think I'll also emphasize this, at least one, but there may be more than one, but you're guaranteed at least one zero in that interval. So there's a quick look at how to use the intermediate value theorem, and it's actually pretty easy to do. Just evaluate the left endpoint, evaluate the right endpoint. If the function is continuous and those two have different signs, then you're guaranteed that there's at least one zero in that interval.